Hey guys, had a uh, kind of a word for you. Um, had a situation a number of years back where a girl had gotten involved in, in Jiu Jitsu. She was, uh, like most people are when they get into it, they either love it or they hate it. And inevitably what ends up happening is, is um, those who love it, um, they really love it. Like it becomes an idol in their life. And I've seen this in the last 16, 17 years that I've been doing it. Um, I've seen this a lot where it, it begins to overwhelm literally every single part of their life. One of the things that I noticed in this girl is that her husband was, was kind of pushing back at her. She was um, training all the time. It consumed everything that she was doing. And when it was all said and done, she, uh, she had to make a choice between her husband and her marriage and jiu-jitsu. And ultimately, she ended up choosing jiu-jitsu and, and leaving. Now, this was a girl who, who taught Sunday school class. She, she was heavily involved in her church, you know, um, all of this. She had a huge support structure of friends, of truly um, dedicated and, and believing Christian brothers and sisters around her. And that's, that's a key point there, is to have that kind of support group, to have that kind of support structure um, in and around you of believers who are not just kind of pseudo-Christians, yeah, I believe, and then it in no way touches any part of their life, but believers that depend on you to hold them accountable to walking with Christ and that accept you to do the same. And this is the kind of support structure that she had and and that um, that I really think is, is a missing element in the church today. But guys that hold themselves accountable to other guys and girls the same way and so on and so forth. Anyway, what ended up happening was is she found herself basically in a situation of choosing between what she knew was right, which was her marriage, um, and choosing between her what had become her idol um, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And ultimately she ended up choosing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, walking away from her marriage, and things like this. I say all that to say this. There was a point in that particular encounter where where I had to confront this girl and, and say, look, you know, I mean, as a sister, as somebody who, who also participates in BJJ, I think you're becoming consumed. I think you're letting this take precedence over every other aspect of your life, including your marriage and your faith and everything. Um, I was immediately shunned and, and rejected. She was then confronted by other guys uh, or other, uh, other people um, who were also Christians and who also had participated in BJJ. Um, she immediately rejected that. She was confronted by her church and her pastor. She didn't like that. She left the church. The point is, is that when you're engaged in sinful activity, oftentimes you become the last one to see it. You're, you're blinded by that sin. But one thing that we can do is to hold each other accountable. Now, that being said, when you look around the room and the only people who are still supporting you, the only people who are standing by your side are unbelievers, people living in rebellion against God, things like this, that should be a huge red flag as to the direction that you've chosen, as to the, the path that you've chosen. Because if you find yourself on a road that is only traveled by unbelievers, that is only traveled by those who are willfully living in rebellion against God, you have to ask yourself, am I still on the path with Christ? And unfortunately, um, this girl, you know, departed from it and she did her own thing and, and then proceeded to tell everybody about how she felt like this is what God wanted for her all along and, and so on and so forth. And guys, this is, this is nothing but self-justifying your sin and it is a huge, huge issue. Um, when we look at 
the, the three different words that are kind of used to cover rebelliousness and, and sin and, and stuff like that in the Old Testament, when we look at the Hebrew, we see that that word sin is talking about kind of an outward ongoing lifestyle of, of living, you know, against God's will. But it's almost like the word is used, it's that word chada, that is that is almost unknowing like I don't know that I'm necessarily living in rebellion but when we get to the word transgression that's the word uh, Pesha I believe and that word is talking about living in like I have knowledge of what I'm doing and I'm doing it anyway I'm living in direct rebellion I know what I'm doing is wrong I know what God says but I'm living in rebellion anyway and then the next word that we look at is that word iniquity. And that word is the word, uh, I think it's Avon. And uh, if you guys speak Hebrew and stuff, you're probably uh, more familiar with the pronunciation than I am. But anyway, the point is, is when I look at that word Avon, it's got the idea of perverseness, of depravity, um, you know, of perverting the truth. And... I want you to see that as unbelievers, we lived in a state of sin. We were covered in sin, but once we became believers, now our actions become transgression where we know what we're supposed to do. We know what's right and we choose to to walk a different path. We choose to walk in rebellion and this is transgression. This is direct rebelliousness against God. But then kind of the next stage that occurs is when we go in there and we start self-justifying our actions and now we're in iniquity. Now we're sitting there and we're perverting what God says so that we can tweak it and mold it and change it and make it say what we want to say like this girl did where she's like, well, I've never been happier. Um, you know, I've got this new relationship. You know, I'm fooling around with this guy behind the scenes and, and so on and so forth. But I've never been closer to God. Guys, that's that's just utter perversity. All right, that's utter rebellion. And what happens is, is even when we look at Romans 1, we see that when we live in that willful rejection, when we live in that, um, that rebellious state, God gives us over to depravity. He gives us over to that mindset and says, okay, if that's what you want to do, have at it. But understand that there are consequences for that. So I wanted to kind of share that with you guys today. If you do have that kind of support structure, which I, I pray that you do, and if you don't, I pray that you would ask God for it. If you do have that kind of support structure of other guys and girls around you who can hold you accountable, not just to living an outward lifestyle, but can hold you accountable to to walking with Christ, to truly walking with Christ and, and can instruct you in meekness and in love as Paul talks about. If you do have that kind of structure or support structure around you, I would encourage you when they come to you and they're like, hey, you're in this or you're in that or, you know, hey, you know, set aside that initial response there and ask yourself, what is most important with you? your walk with Christ or your immediate happiness here in this world because as Christians we know that that there are ultimate consequences for our actions um, we know that if we are a Christian that there's nothing more important than our fellowship with Christ um, even if that means you know rejecting some idols in our lives that maybe we, we've truly come to to love um, we want to go ahead and, and get rid of those things. But in the event that we fall into sin and we look around the room and we find ourselves that the only people who are supporting our actions, the only people who are still around to support us are unbelieving people, people who are willfully living in rebellion against God and, and that type of pseudo-Christian environment, then it should be a huge red flag as to the path that we're on and where that path leads. So anyway, I want to share that with you guys today. So God bless.